Welcome, Shelly. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you on. And let's dive right in. So as I've told you before, our audience really loves to listen about, you know, from women who have been successful and, you know, made made a name for themselves in their careers. Um, so tell us a little bit about your story. Who is Shelly? What did you learn along your journey? And just tell us all about that. Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for having me as a guest on your podcast. I am really excited to be here. Um, I am a, an attorney that's been in practice for over 23 years, and mm-hmm. I have primarily worked at two law firms throughout the course of those 23 years. Mm-hmm. Um, my current firm that I've been at for, I think I'm going on my eighth year, is one of the top 100 firms in the country. And my area of specialty is investment management, and that encompasses alternative investment funds, which means that I represent hedge funds and private equity funds and venture capital type of funds and the managers that manage those products. So it's a really specialized area. And uh, well, I think it's impossible for me to whittle down to just like one lesson that I've learned along the way, mm-hmm. if I can impart anything that I think is the most beneficial lesson that I have learned. And I think this goes for, um, it, it could hold true at any age, but really it holds true when you're younger. Mm-hmm. It's to absolutely never say no. Mm-hmm. And just to give you an example of that, uh-huh. um, when I joined my prior firm, and I was there for a very long time, over 13 years, I joined at a time when the alternative investment fund universe was in its nascent stage and not a lot of people knew about it Mm -hmm. or had expertise in the subject matter Mm -hmm. and but it was explosive and the firm was hiring hand over foot they couldn't get enough bodies in the door to help with the work and i ended up joining with a group of other associates and the other two people who joined me and was within the span of a month Mm -hmm. They had come from bigger firms. I had come from a very tiny boutique firm. And I was very insecure that I didn't have the requisite experience, that I didn't know anything, and that I would have a lot of catching up to do. So when I joined the firm, I made it my mission to learn as much as I could in as short of a time frame as I could so that I could quote unquote catch up. Mm -hmm. And that led to, on top of all of the work that I was getting right out of the gate, also getting more work from other partners as they would ask if anyone was available to do their projects. I just kept saying yes. I would never say no to anyone. And it's funny because all of that was driven out of this fear that I had to catch up and then move ahead. Mm -hmm. But looking back now, that was kind of silly. It ended up propelling me, but it was silly for me to have that mentality because no one knew one thing about the alternative space. We were right. all neophytes. Mm-hmm. And it didn't matter if you were a fifth year or a first year or a third year, we were all literally in the same boat. So this concept of never saying no and being overloaded with work, it had two really fantastic ramifications for me. Mm-hmm. One is I became the go-to person that mm-hmm. was given work by all of the partners and Along those lines, I learned a lot about subject matters that I didn't know anything about. And it wasn't because I was um, the be- necessarily the best lawyer out there, but I was the most willing to just jump in and figure out those assignments because mm-hmm. I didn't know that I didn't know anything. I didn't have <laughs> anything to fear. I, right. I knew nothing to begin with. So right. I started at a place where I really had to learn everything. Mm -hmm. And it ended up setting me apart because, of course, all the partners wanted to work with me, as I mentioned. Right. But in the end, I became incredibly valuable because Mm. I was the person who knew about this esoteric area of the law or how do you solve this problem in an agreement? I was the person that had done all of this before. Mm -hmm. And that propelled me. It ultimately helped me to make partner at an earlier age because I just became the resident expert in the subject matter. That's fantastic. And I find it um, very unique in that 
you had these limiting beliefs that caused you to say, okay, I'm just going to dive into everything and learn as much as I can so that I can, you know, catch up per se. Right. Um, but the other thing that it helped you do is it helped you bypass that fear where people are like, how am I going to learn this? Or I don't know this. So there's so many people who opt out because they don't know something. And instead you use that as a say as as a kind of driver to say i'm going to just dive in and learn as much as i can even if i don't know it um so that you can become an expert the question i have for you and, and a lot of um you know our listeners ask is that what were some of the habits like how did you consume so much how did you learn um was there anything particular that you did to so that you could kind of learn um all of the you know everything that was coming toward you so that is such a great question. I, I now looking back, I have this notion and this philosophy that it doesn't matter what you ultimately do in your career. You have to start somewhere. Right. And whether you are a lawyer or you're in investment banking or you go another route, there are still foundational elements that you need to learn in order to be successful in any space that you are in within that particular discipline. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to legal, that's the one I can speak to, mm -hmm. you need to learn how to just be a lawyer. You need to learn how to review a contract and spot issues. You need to learn how to use defined terms when you're drafting documents. You need to learn how to review due diligence and come up with and spot the issues in that kind of material. Mm -hmm. And the only way for you to move on and excel in a career is to have those building blocks, to have the foundation. Mm -hmm. So wherever you start, whether it is a job that you have landed and it's your dream job and you're super excited about it, or it's something that you are starting, but it's not necessarily your dream job, but you're there, mm -hmm. you should take full advantage of learning everything that you can uh, right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. How do I review documents? How do I draft a contract? And try to talk to the people in your group mm -hmm. and ask them, what does this mean in a contract? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there and say, I don't really understand what this says. Everyone is afraid to acknowledge that they don't know anything. Mm -hmm. But that is very silly. I have never put myself in a position where I was afraid to ask those kind of questions because I knew it would only haunt me in the long run. I'd rather ask the question in advance mm -hmm. and find out how to do the project in the correct way and understand the implication and what I was doing mm -hmm. rather than turn in an assignment to a partner and it's wrong. And now I have to do it all over again. And to boot, they're angry that I wasted all of their time and right. I have to start again. Right. So get it done correctly from the get-go and make sure you understand the project that you're working on. And the, I can speak to this person. I, I sat in um, a meeting one time and the partner that I worked for, he was, it was, he was a brilliant lawyer and he was a really great business developer, but we were sitting in this meeting and it involved a bunch of different disciplines. There was a corporate lawyer, there was an investment management lawyer, there was a tax lawyer, mm -hmm. and there was someone else in the room. And we were all talking about this project that needed to be done. And they were speaking, the partners were speaking high level. I was the associate in the room who was going to be drafting the document. Right. And they all got together and spoke a million miles a minute. I took notes furiously. I had no idea what I was even writing. Right. And, in the, and in the end, they said, okay, great. All right, Shelly, draft that. And I looked down at my notes and I thought, I don't understand one thing about this project. I don't even know what they just said. Mm -hmm. And I decided right then and there, I just had to be courageous and ask the question right on the spot. And don't be afraid to look stupid. So I said, I'm sorry. I know I'm going to take up a few more minutes of your time, but I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. What am I drafting here? When they had to stop and think about how we would put pen to paper, how were we actually going to draft whatever it was I was drafting, a contract, a letter, whatever it was, when they had to think about what would go down into that paperwork, they realized it didn't really make sense. It didn't, what they were saying was too high level. Mm -hmm. And we went back to the drawing board. We spent another 10 or 15 minutes and we actually hashed out what was linearly supposed to go into this document. Mm -hmm. And it 
I it changed the course of my week that I was able mm, to get that yes. information in advance, mm-hmm. as opposed to sitting there stressing, sweating it out. What am I doing? I have to hand this into four partners. I don't even know what I'm writing. Doesn't make any sense. Right. But the, the thing that always stuck with me is after that meeting, one of the other partners approached me in the hallway. He wasn't, I didn't work for him. He was in another group, but he was in that meeting and he came up to me and he said, Shelly, I want you to know, I'm really impressed that you spoke up and that you said you didn't understand what this assignment was because most people do not admit that they don't understand. And then they hand in something that's mediocre because they didn't understand what they were supposed to do to begin with, but you Mm -hmm. stopped it right there. And you made sure that you understood what it was that you were supposed to be doing. And that lesson has stuck with me every day since Mm -hmm. that time. And on the flip side, Mm -hmm. now that I'm on the other side, I'm the partner that's giving out assignments. I know when I'm talking to one of my young associates, that there's no possible way they can know as much as I know. I've been doing this for 23 years. They've been doing it for two to four. Mm -hmm. So when they sit there with their eyes glazed over and I'm trying to explain an assignment and maybe I'm not doing a great job or maybe it's just hard to process that much information in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. I always say to them, please ask me questions. Tell me what you don't understand about what I just said. Mm -hmm. There's no expectation that you are supposed to know you're here to learn. Let me help you. Let's Mm -hmm. do this in a way that doesn't make me have to review this contract six times. I want to review it once. That's such tangible advice. I mean, it's so true because I, I can recall, you know, a couple of times in my career where you are afraid to ask that question. You don't ask that question. And then you spend so much time, you waste so much time, do, you know, fretting over it. You turn in something, like you said, is mediocre. And then you have to revisit it and rehash it and it gets redlined all over again. Yep. So that, like you said, you being courageous enough to ask that question and it just taking an additional 10 minutes probably saved you hours of work that would have had, you know, work that would have to be redone. Hours, without so a doubt. Fantastic. And hours of stress. Absolutely. Hours of stress. Yes. Um, now, one question I want to ask is, you know, you pursued your law degree. How, how did you gain that clarity? How did you identify what your career path was going to be, what your strengths were? And then even more so, because I know that, you know, from a limited frame of reference, when I think about lawyers, I probably have a a bias or an unconscious bias of, you know, I just see, you know, lawyers in a courtroom. You are a very different lawyer. How did you, how did you figure that out? What, like, what really led you down your path? Okay. That's a really great question. I don't think that as a young person, you can possibly know which path you want to take and what will Mm -hmm. be best for you. You don't know what you don't know. And Mm -hmm. the only way to know it is to do it. Mm -hmm. So you have to be in a position where you're willing to just dive into something, whether it is litigation or the transactional side, I'm on the transactional side, I'm never in court. Mm -hmm. It's just the choice that you have to make. But if I can back up a little bit uh, and give you a really good example of something that happened to me Mm -hmm. that did actually put me on this career path. Yes. When I was in law school, my, during my first year of law school, mm-hmm. you don't specialize when you're in law school, especially in your mm-hmm. first year. Right. You're there to just learn about the law, learn how to read uh, statutes and learn what it means to be a lawyer. You take classes like criminal law, torts, uh, constitutional law. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't use constitutional law or criminal law or torts in application of what I do today. I Mm -hmm. I just don't use it. It doesn't have any relevance to me. But you have to get foundational experience and just learn how to read and learn how what it means to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So during my first year, I thought, you know, I have a lot of friends that are in investment banking. They are doing more corporate focused jobs. Mm -hmm. They're in programs. Maybe I should know something about corporate and securities law. That might be something that I am interested in. And that was based in nothing, literally nothing, because right. I was a psychology major in college. Uh-huh. So I hadn't even taken an economics course. I took no business courses, no securities law at that point in time. I just kind of had this, maybe I should try something that I don't know anything about. Maybe right. I'll like it. 
And where better to get that experience than at the SEC? Mm. So I applied for an internship at the SEC in the New York office. And uh, this was before, this predates the internet and emails and cell phones. So I had to actually mail in by regular mail (laughs) my resume. And I didn't hear anything and I didn't hear anything. And I've always been one of those people that I follow up and I make sure that I, my resume got to the right person. Mm -hmm. So I found the person who was in charge of the internship program at the SEC. Mm -hmm. And somehow I'm sure after 50 calls, I got him on the line and we started chatting and he said, Shelly, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but we, you missed our first round of interviews. We have already done that. We whittled down from hundreds, if not thousands of applicants down to 50. We're in round two, A, Uh and B, we're not looking for one else. We're looking for two L's. So I, I'm sorry, but you kind of missed the boat here. I don't know what came over me, but I said to him, I am an eager young person. I have this earnestness to learn. I am super excited about the idea of learning about something that I know absolutely nothing about. And how can I ever get a shot unless you give it to me? And it's this vicious cycle. And I feel so defeated in this moment because all I want to do is learn and I don't want to be turned down. And I'm I just, I have this, you know, light inside of me that I really want to learn about the SEC. Right. I I don't even know where that came from, but (laughs) I I kept this guy on the phone for a good 40 minutes. And he said, I, I hear you. And I'm sorry that I have to turn you down, but apply next year. Now, you know, when, now, you know, when you have to do it, right. Keep in touch with me, which I've been planning on doing anyway, and you can apply next year and that'll be fine. I said, thank you so much hung up the phone. I still felt so sad, but that was on me. And I didn't even know there was a first round of interviews, Right. but he called me back four days later. And he said, come in, you can interview. I've been thinking about what? you. Wow. And I don't want to turn you down. Yeah. I can't make no guarantees. We're looking for two L's and we have 50 candidates and it's only going to be six to 10 that we hire for the summer. Mm-hmm. So, but come in, go ahead, go through the experience. I, I won't turn you down. You can meet my colleagues and we'll see what happens. I was so excited. I hung up the phone and then I was terrified because (laughs) I didn't know anything. And I knew that what do you ask typically when you're in, or what do people ask when you're in an interview? They say, tell us about your experience. Tell us why you want to be here. And I, my experience was off point and Mm -hmm. zero. I had none. And why I want to be there was just, I was eager and excited and whatever. So I had to figure out a way to show them that mm-hmm. I really was excited and that I really did have this um, earnestness and um, willingness to learn a new subject matter. Mm-hmm. So I took out the Wall Street Journal every day until my interviews and I cut out articles that mentioned the SEC every single day. And then I highlighted them, I underlined them and I wrote two to four questions per article. And I brought it in to my interviews. I didn't know how many people I was meeting with. It turns out it was five plus the other guys of so six in total. Right. And every person that I met with, the first thing I did was pull out an article and engage in a conversation. I made them tell me why this was important to the SEC, what they thought about it, what was the impact, uh, how, what would it mean for me if I were to join? How should I be thinking about it? I just did everything I could to detract from my lack of experience right. and to try to make them see that I was someone they would want to have working in their unit. Right. And I don't know what happened, but it did work. (laughs) And for me, it was a career, that was a a game changer and a career changer. Mm. Because with the SEC, that under my belt, the experience that I got, plus on my resume, it launched me into these jobs that were more corporate and securities focused. And Mm -hmm. ultimately it did get me into the alternative space. So now what can you do? How can you be that kind of a person? that was luck. I ended up really enjoying that Mm -hmm. space, but if I didn't like it, I could have done something else. And I would have tried, I would have done the exact same thing. I would have pulled those tricks out of my hat in some other discipline or other field next year. And you can do that. You can make those kind of choices and they're not mistakes. They're clarity. They're getting Mm -hmm. you to the place. They're honing you in on the thing that you like or don't like. Maybe it's by process of elimination that you find out what you do like to do. Right. 
That's fantastic. And I, you know, because there was a level of, like you said, you were proactive, you followed up, but then you were able to, you know, in that moment, show your passion. Um, But what I love about your story is you didn't allow the fact that you had no experience, you weren't a right fit, you didn't opt out, you went forward, you shared, you know, your passion and your drive and your story of why you wanted to do it. And that authenticity came through. And I really do believe that's probably why you ended up landing the job was because of that eagerness. And it didn't matter what you knew or what you didn't know. You're all, I mean, that's the whole premise of the internship or the entry-level job, right? You're there to learn. And, and I think we forget that. We forget that recruiters and others are really looking for the competencies of the individual to understand, does this person have the competencies and um, you know, the drive to learn isn't coming in here thinking like they're a know-it-all kind of thing. Um, because every, every company has a different way of doing things, you know, the culture, the, the way that they do things, the processes. So you really, the biggest superpower is showing people that you are eager to learn and know how to learn. I think that's the important piece. And I love that it comes out so amazingly in your story. Now, another important thing is that you struck a chord you created kind of like you a relationship with this person on the phone like you said you kept them on for you know 40 minutes but you intended to follow up talk a little bit about you know what is your key what are what are the habits and the things that you use in in building kind of long-lasting relationships or relationships that are helpful um that you can leverage in in you know that in the past or in the future okay that's another good one so I spent a lot of time learning my craft as an alternatives investment management lawyer. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously a given if you're going to move up the ranks and be successful within a law firm. And and that has application across any field. It doesn't matter where you work. You have to learn that space. You have to become a specialist and really understand and gain knowledge of what it means and how the parts all come together and how you can see the bigger picture and oh, you have this, all of a sudden there's clarity. Oh, I get it. I get how this all works together. Mm -hmm. But once you have, once you're moving up a little bit in the ranks and you see that you really enjoy what you're doing and you're getting the experience, the next step, well, I will say the next step for me, and I think it is Mm -hmm. pretty important for anyone to be thinking about. And I don't think that this is necessarily intuitive, And I'm sorry they don't teach more of these classes when you're in law school or an undergrad, but business development is not something that Mm. comes naturally to everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just not. It's a skill. It's a learned skill like anything else. Some people have a natural ability and they can do it better right off the bat, but nonetheless, you still have to learn how to do it. And in my case, Once I knew that I really enjoyed this field and I knew I wanted to be a partner in this group, I knew that I had to develop a book of business on my own because Mm -hmm. business development is one way that you preserve your future. If Mm. you are someone who can bring in and show a propensity to be able to bring in revenues, you're going to be important to that group. You know, that's a, when you are part of the revenue generation, as opposed to the cost sector, yes. mm-hmm. then you know, you have, you're adding real value to yourself. So how do you do that? Well, I ended up very, I'll, I can tell you what happened with me and I have some really good tips. And mm-hmm. then I can tell you other things that I think people should be thinking about and doing Absolutely. now that I have this clarity. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I worked for at my prior firm, I worked for this partner And he was the best business developer I've ever seen in my life. He just, Mm -hmm. he had the gift for it and he studied really hard. So at an early age, I latched onto him. I would shadow him and I'd ask him to take me everywhere. And he was willing, he wanted to, he was happy to be a mentor. Mm -hmm. So he'd bring me to meetings and I would start out, whether the meeting was for business development, whether it was a meet and greet where we were just meeting other people in our community to see how we could maybe cross sell to one another, mm-hmm. or whether it was an actual client. I always made a point that any meeting I was brought to, I was not there to be wallpaper. So I better say something, right. which meant I had to be present and think about something in a way that I can add value, 
even if it turns out I wasn't really adding value, but do that, start to get comfortable speaking up at these meetings. Mm -hmm. So every meeting I went to, it, it never ended with me being silent. I had to say something at every meeting. And some of them were misses and some of them were hits, but over time they became more hits than misses because I learned right. how to do it just mm -hmm. by experience. Then I sat in this one meeting with him. He asked me if I would join him for one of these meet and greets. So in my field, mm -hmm. we have um, funds and they have a bunch of different service providers service providers can be complementary, or we can be in competition with one another. But right. for the most part, the service providers in my space, unless they're other lawyers, they're complementary. So we can all try to help each other land clients. Right. So we do a lot of these meetings so that we can all know each other and have one another refer business. Mm -hmm. Got in on one of these meetings. It was a banking meeting. Um, these people came from an, an investment bank. I forgot which sector. And then he brought me to the meeting. He was in our office and we sat down and the meeting droned on for 50 plus minutes. And he abruptly ended, my partner abruptly ended it. And we walked out and I thought, this is really weird. This is unlike him. I, I know that he doesn't want to sit around longer than he has to, but he barely said a word. And that is unlike him. He is right. always going to sell his message. We walked out, the team from the bank walked to the right. We went left. And the minute we rounded the corner, he stopped me and said, do not ever do that in a meeting. And he was yelling at me. And I thought, oh my God, I messed up this meeting. I the one. Uh -huh. And I said, I, I will never do that again. What did I do? He said, you, you didn't do anything. I'm like, well, what did they do? He said, well, tell me what you learned in that meeting from the guy on the other side, who was me, the, the head guy. Right, right. He said, I learned that where he went to college, I learned um, where he had his, where he got his first job, right. I learned his last four jobs. I know how many children he has. And he stopped me and he said, exactly. He said, when we're in those meetings, you have maximum five minutes to sell your story and make your pitch lead with it. Do not share your history and your background. That's the last thing you share. The first thing you share is what you can do for the other person and how you can be of help and service to their clients. And that is the purpose of that meeting. We were not at a cocktail hour schmoozing about our families. Right. We were there to relay to one another what we can, how we can be helpful to one another. So he said to me, I don't even know what that meeting was about. I had to walk out of there because whatever message he relayed, it was way too late. It was 40 minutes in mm -hmm. and my eyes were already glazed over and I wasn't paying attention. And mm -hmm. while I'm happy that he's had a great life, none of that was relevant. So mm. don't ever do that. And I have never done that ever to this day. Right. I lead with my message. And that's really important to understand when you are trying to develop your brand and your business, mm -hmm. lead with the things that you want to leave people with, because that's what they're going to remember. And right. let them know always how you can help them. Mm -hmm. Saying how they can help you is very minuscule in terms of importance, right. but saying how you can help someone else, even if ultimately it's them helping you. And just by way of example, when I sit in these meetings now mm -hmm. and they're telling me that we all want us to refer business to one another. So when they're telling me what they do and I tell them what I do, I always end with, but here's how I can be helpful to you. Let me make you look good. If mm -hmm. you have questions that you get asked that you think are more legal in nature and you don't know the answer, call me. I'll tell you how to answer the question right. or I'll give you a framework on how to answer the question so that you can look knowledgeable in front of your clients. Mm -hmm. And it served me so well because people have actually called me. They take me up on that right. and they ask me and then it makes them remember me. And you need to find ways to be memorable. The other thing that I think is really important to remember during this journey Mm -hmm. as you're growing in your career, when you meet people. So if you go to a cocktail hour, this partner that I, I worked with for all these years, he'd go to a cocktail hour and he'd walk away with 50 business cards and it would be a stack, you know, an inch thick. Mm -hmm. And after he'd say to me, I would look at those cards and I'd be like, well, how do you, do? I can't believe you were able to do that. And he said, yeah, okay. So I could do that. I walked around the room. I got 50 cards, but so what? It's what I do with those cards that matters. Not that I right. collected them. Mm -hmm. Now is the time that the real work happens. Now I have to follow up with them. I have to invite them for lunch. I have to send them literature. I have to make sure that I'm on their radar screen. 
because as much as it's great for us to know who other people are that we can refer to, it's way more important for them to know who they should be referring to. Right. So let's not let them forget. Mm-hmm. And follow up is crucial. Always yeah. follow up when you're trying to develop new business. Very important. And oh, and I I meant to say this earlier, and then I kind of got lost in my stories. But yeah, I don't. Not everyone has such an amazing mentor who can teach them the ins and outs of business right. development. And, and that's okay because you can hire people that can help you with that. Mm-hmm. When you're young, hiring someone who is um, a coach, who can help you get on mm-hmm. stage, who can help you think about how to present yourself, how to enunciate, where, how to make eye contact. Mm-hmm. All of those things are learned skills. Yes. And hiring someone when you're younger to make you be better at that at a younger age will make that rote as you get older so you mm-hmm. can focus on other things you don't have to learn multiple skills at the same time right you can just learn how to maybe interact better when you're at a cocktail hour as opposed to how do I make eye contact how do I shake someone's hand how do I present myself and enunciate and mm-hmm. make my voice heard so those are all tips that I would give to a young person I think hiring a coach is a great way to get yourself ahead of your peers that is such valuable information because one of the things that we've learned and, and research shows it, right? Women don't invest in themselves as much as the men do um, in, in hiring coaches or outsourcing those types of things to learn. Um, and it's so important because it does kind of give you that edge uh, and, and, and helps you. And it's sometimes the smallest shift, two millimeter shift that'll take you in a completely different tra- trajectory that is so important. Um, Now, one of the things that you mentioned, and we'll wrap up with this, is, you know, we talked a little bit about relationships, but I think what was so important is that some of your biggest mentors, some of the biggest sponsors you had were men. And we get this question all the time from women um, where, you know, they're in organizations that may be very male dominated, and they're looking for other women to look up to and role model, which is absolutely fair and and the right thing to do. But... they're missing the opportunity sometimes of, you know, getting mentored by people who don't look like them or think like them. What what is your word advice in terms of how did you strike up um, mentorships, relationships, sponsorships with people who didn't look like you because you were in an industry that is much more male dominated. And, uh, you know, how did you not allow that to, you know, hold you back? Yeah. Okay. So when I started out as a lawyer in the alternative space, mm-hmm. there were no women. I, I don't, I could not name one woman, one female partner. And there might, I'm sure there were a few, mm-hmm. but I didn't know any of them. They weren't they visible. They weren't visible right. and they weren't in my group. And quite frankly, not a lot of people were visible in general. It didn't have to just be women, men as well, mm-hmm. because it was a new space. And there were only a few people who were kind of pioneers in the space. Mm-hmm. So it developed over time. And I made the decision that I didn't care who was there to help me. It didn't mm-hmm. matter if it was a woman or a man, it didn't matter who it was. Mm-hmm. I was going to learn from whoever was willing to impart their wisdom. Mm. And I would be a willing and able student. And I made myself, even though you're right, I didn't can. I wouldn't have been friends with that partner who was my mentor. Right. We were very, very different. And we weren't even in the same age bracket. Obviously he was a lot older than right. me. I was very young and he had made a name for himself and I was just there coming up the ranks, but it didn't matter. I still sat with him. I tried to understand him. I befriended all of the partners in my group mm-hmm. and the ones that I connected more with that I just felt a little bit were more interested in looking out for my well-being mm-hmm. were the people that I ended up focusing on. Okay. But now I think there are so many more opportunities because there are so many more women in right. what I do. And in general, I mean, in the mm-hmm. last 20 years, since I started practicing, there are so many more females. Right. And I think it's important that if you are younger, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a woman that you can go to, or a man. Right. if you're a woman, it doesn't have to be a woman. If you're a woman doesn't have to be a man. It should be someone that you value Mm. who can help you. It doesn't even have to be someone you like that much. Right. You know, it could be someone who has, who knows something that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And as long as you are 
when you present yourself in the right way to someone, when you say to someone, I could really learn from you. I, you did this really well. I watched you. Can you tell me a little bit about how you did that? Compliments go a long way. Right. And it makes someone really interested in sharing their story. And from my vantage point, when I, after I made partner at my prior firm and I made partner really young mm -hmm. and I was a, a neophyte and just trying to make my way, but we had hired a bunch of female associates, which was mm -hmm. great. And one of them I was pretty close with mm -hmm. and all of the advice that I had received along the way, I gave to her. Right. And then it was up to her to decide whether she wanted to listen or not. She listened to, she made partner at a really young age as well. Mm -hmm. And it's not that my advice was so great, but it's that it worked in this environment. I, mm -hmm. I was right. I happened to be right about some of these points. Right. And it just, it ended up ingratiating both of us into the practice. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be to find someone, it doesn't even have to be someone who's in your practice area, but just someone who is good at what they do and try to befriend them and ask them questions and compliment them and tell them what they do that's they've done well. Right. And how can you translate that? And it goes a long way. And over time, I think you develop relationships naturally with some people and other people, maybe less so, but never forget that you can also learn from other people's failures or from the mm. people's skill set that you don't like. Because I saw a partner in my, it wasn't, he wasn't in my group, but he was in a, uh, an adjacent group. Right. And I didn't like how he presented himself. I didn't like his style. Mm -hmm. And he, people would ask him a question and he would answer something off to the side. And it always annoyed me. And I thought, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be like that. I want to mm -hmm. answer the question that is asked. Right. Because there, I'm here for a reason. I'm your fiduciary. I'm your value add. I better be able to answer your questions. And right. if I don't answer your questions that you are asking me, I'm showing you that I don't really know the subject matter. Mm -hmm. So you can also learn from the things that you don't think that people are doing very well. And right. I would encourage anyone to pay attention to all of that. That's so important. So what you were saying in a nutshell is that you identified who was being successful and trying to understand the traits, the characteristics, the habits or what they were doing well. And that, you know, definition of success may not look like you. So you've got to learn from that individual what they're doing. And I think the courage to just say, look, this is what success looks like. I'm going to learn from this person who's doing it really well, but being authentic and saying, I could learn so much from you goes a long way and, and being able to do that. And I think that's so important and valuable because sometimes, you know, I personally too, sometimes would get into this thing of like, okay, I need to figure this out on my own. And instead, you know, when I did have somebody that would take me under their wing, you, you accelerate so quickly because you're kind of learning, like you said, they're giving you the rules of the road. They're telling you sometimes the unwritten rules of the road. And the other important thing that you mentioned is that learning from their mistakes. And so they say, don't do this or learning what not to do because of what they've done. And in some cases, like you said, just observing people in what they're doing where you're like, okay, <laughs> I don't want to do that. I so I think it's that. so valuable what you've shared. And I think for you, um, the, the, the courage that you've displayed in, in saying, I'm going to ask the question, even if it makes me look dumb or, you know, it makes me look silly, but it's going to save you so much time on the, on the other side, on the other end. I think that's so important. Um, mm -hmm. So that said, I mean, anything you want to, any parting words that you want to share with our listeners in terms of, you know, accelerating their success? Um, what, you know, what words of advice, pearls of wisdom do you want to leave them with? Okay. Well, for me, I have always been driven by a lot of fear, the fear of failure, the, you know, the female centric imposter syndrome. Yes. And I've had to, I've had to really work and spend time to overcome that. And one of the things that I think is incredibly valuable to do when you feel that way, when you feel like you're either you're inadequate or you don't know as much as someone else, or you don't know as much as your peers, whether or not it's true, because that's, that's a, that's on you. And we always have these limiting beliefs as females that we uh, don't know as much as our peers, but that's based not in one ounce of fact, usually. Mm -hmm. And 
one way to help yourself overcome that is to do something that you're very afraid of doing. Just jump Mm -hmm. off the diving board and do it. For me, it ended up being public speaking. Mm. I was really terrified to do it. It goes right back to that imposter syndrome. If I speak publicly, then you're going to find me out. But (laughs) I did it. I knew I had to do it. So a long time ago, I made the decision that I was going to just get out there. And if I failed, I failed. And so what? So be it. But I'm going to do it. And I know that each time I do it, it's going to get a little bit easier. And the results of that, this incredible fear of public speaking that I had was, I, which I didn't realize until after the fact, right. so you, you come, when you're public speaking, you're on stage in front of an audience. The audience can be 10 people or it could be a thousand people, mm-hmm. but you are one person and they're all watching you. So you kind of become an expert. You become the quote unquote celebrity of that environment right. and people want to talk to you. So the first speaking engagement that I ever decided to take on was international. I had to fly internationally to a conference. Wow, okay. (laughs) Yep, it was a big conference. I had actually attended the conference before as a participant, Mm -hmm. but this year I was going to be a speaker. And I was going to speak about a subject matter that I knew absolutely nothing about. It was an international regulation that had just come out but it could have potentially impacted my clients. And I thought I might as well learn it right now before it even becomes effective. (laughs) So I spent one full month preparing every single day for this conference. I learned the regulation. I asked myself questions. I did everything I could to be as prepared as possible. I got on that overnight flight. I slept for zero minutes. I rolled (laughs) right into the conference. I probably looked like a zombie, but I got on stage terrified and my heart was pounding, but I did it. And I did a good job. And I promptly walked off that stage and slept for the next 17 hours. But the next day I attended the conference because this was the first thing that happened. It was like the kickoff to the conference. Right. So I attended the conference and I noticed how all of these people kept coming over to talk to me. Mm-hmm. And usually in conferences, people do not try to come over and talk to the lawyers. You know, we're not your number one choice. <laughs> right the conversation, but I had so many people approach me and it was all because I was recognizable. They were either Mm. asking me about what I had spoken about, or they just wanted to have a conversation with me. I got invited to a few dinners. It made me like a celebrity almost. I was a known entity. Mm -hmm. I realized that as far as building a personal brand, becoming known in your field, that's one way to really capture it because people remember you. You do it once, they know that you did it. You do it again, they remember, oh, I saw her at the last one. And Mm -hmm. then they want to talk to you. And then you circle a room and people are coming up to you. It's the exact opposite of feeling like you don't know anyone. You have to stick your hand into a conversation and just hope for the best. Right. So that I, I would really say, do something that you're completely fearful of. Take a risk. There's no such thing as an ultimate failure. I mean, really, what, what are you going to possibly do that's an ultimate failure? Nothing. Right. You're just going to learn from it and it'll make you better, make good decisions at the time, and then move forward. That's fantastic. And I think your point of how powerful visibility is and how powerful your brand um, can be, that alone can give you, can create opportunities, attracts the opportunity um, I think that is so valuable. Shelly, you've been amazing. Your stories have been so, they've resonated so much. And I know that our listeners are going to really um, probably enjoy listening to you and wanting to reach out because, you know, just uh, you, the lessons that you've shared are, are so um, tangible that I wouldn't put it past anybody wanting to reach out. So in that case, how could someone, how does someone stay connected with you? Is it LinkedIn? What's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, LinkedIn is a great way to reach mm-hmm. out to me. Um, checking out my bio on my firm's website and my email is up there. I would be happy to hear from anyone. I'd be delighted to talk to anyone. That's one way that I feel great about passing it along. And I, I, I'm pretty visible. So at LinkedIn and any email to my um, work email would be great. And I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone as well. Yeah. Fantastic. And thank you so much. And thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.